As Nixon's first year in the White House came to a close, the number of Americans being killed in Vietnam remained high. We wanted to end the war, but you can't turn this thing off as if it were a television channel. Nixon's new strategy was Vietnamization. He began to withdraw American troops, announcing that South Vietnam would take over the ground war. Privately, he began direct negotiations with the North Vietnamese, excluding South Vietnam's President Thieu. Simultaneously, he ordered massive secret bombings in Laos and Cambodia. What we attempted to do was to uh, extricate the United States from Vietnam, but to do it in such a way that it would not affect our international responsibilities around the world. More people die, more Americans, and no doubt Vietnamese die, during the Nixon, we're on our way getting out years, than during the Kennedy and Johnson years put together. A nationwide moratorium on October 15, 1969, called for immediate withdrawal from Vietnam. With protests in every city across the country, it became the largest one-day demonstration ever in a Western democracy. Unknown to its participants, the moratorium would significantly alter Nixon's war plans. He was making secret threats of escalation to North Vietnam, secretly from the American public, but not at all secret, of course, from the target of these threats. In short, he made those threats explicitly to the Soviets for the Vietnamese and directly to the Vietnamese, that he was prepared to use nuclear weapons. The march of the moratorium in cities across the country on October 15th, just before his secret ultimatum, was too large. Two million people on one day across the country convinced him reasonably that this was not the time to escalate the war, and in particular, not the time to use nuclear weapons for the first time since Hiroshima. It was pretty clear that there was so much protest in the, within our country that, uh, that it was very difficult to conduct uh, the war at all. Nixon's public response, a speech he wrote himself, was a masterstroke. So tonight, to you, the great silent majority of my fellow Americans, I ask for your support. I pledged in my campaign for the presidency to end the war in a way that we could win the peace. I have initiated a plan of action which will enable me to keep that pledge. Let us be united for peace. Let us also be united against defeat. Because let us understand, North Vietnam cannot defeat or humiliate the United States. Only Americans can do that. And so then the press attacked it, savaged it. And so I wrote Nixon a memo. We said, it's time to attack the media. And I said, the Vice President of the United States ought to deliver this speech. And so I wrote that uh, Agnew speech. And there was one editor for that Agnew speech, Richard Milhouse Nixon. And he said, this will tear the scab off those bastards. And we broke out laughing. <laughs> and it did. <laughs> Perhaps the place to start looking for a credibility gap is not in the offices of the government in Washington, but in the studios of the networks in New York. He was the point man for Richard Nixon's, and Richard Nixon's war against the countercultures. And then with speeches by William Sapphire and Pat Buchanan, he became eventually the hero of the right wing for his attacks on the press. Like Nixon's silent majority, Agnew's famous phrases, effete snobs, and nattering nabobs of negativism served to further polarize the country. Exactly one month after the moratorium, 700,000 Americans converged on Washington. The administration had already ordered the FBI to monitor the demonstration,
convinced that it was influenced by communists. While a handful tried to storm the South Vietnamese embassy, Yale chaplain William Sloan Coffin and Dr. Benjamin Spock led a peaceful march against death from Arlington Cemetery to the White House. Attorney General John Mitchell said it looked like the Russian Revolution. It was the very deep sense of patriotism that animated many of us, not all of us, you know. Sure, there was a certain amount of defiance, revolt, uh, adolescence, if you will, but that's overdone. Our first contingent in this march against death. That our facilities in the White House, in case of a bombing attack, I moved into one of these facilities for a few days and slept in the basement of the White House. And, uh, you know, the White House was ringed by students that were protesting. It didn't interfere with what we were doing, but it was uncomfortable. The following spring, on April 30, 1970, President Nixon announced that American troops had entered Cambodia. By early 1970, anti-war sentiment is so sweeping in America, not only in public opinion, but on the campuses in particular, that it doesn't require any leadership. Protests erupted on campuses nationwide. The murder of four students at Kent State and two at Jackson State by National Guardsmen shocked and further divided the nation. It was as if um, the relationships between the generations had cracked up um, on some fundamental level. And yes, it was, it was about the Vietnam War. It was about uh, race. It was about poverty. But these things seemed to be reflections of a failure on the part of the older generation that was so profound. The movement was moving left and the country was moving right. Uh, the country was polarizing. 